uh, th these poems I'm reading uh, are from um, uh, a new book of poems that I'm so excited about, uh, a manuscript, a full-length book manuscript, um, 81 pages. <laughs> I'm so proud of my 81 pages. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you. And uh, it's just been recently sent off uh, to a few publishers and hoping one of them will publish it soon. But um, so stay tuned for book signings and all sorts of fun things. Uh, this next poem is called Out in My Yard. I love my stars. Out where I live, I ain't got but one hundredth of an acre. But I got 85,263 stars. I got so many stars. Ain't no fence big enough to keep them. I love my stars. Sometimes I'll walk a mile in the sky just to see each and every one of them. If I ain't got but a middle of a spittle, I'll be damned if I ain't got 85,263 stars, all shining brighter than a dime in redemption. I love my stars. Ain't but a yard full of the universe. I love my stars just as pretty as a bowl full of bliss. Okay, this next poem uh, is called Cosmographies and Bloom. Um, among the many things that wowed me when I first moved to Vermont, um, are still wowing me was uh, once you got this far north, uh, the rivers flow north. <laughs> wow, what a magical place is that! <laughs> wow. So, cosmographies in bloom. Down a song flowing north amid the boreal wilderness of innermost transformation appears the realm of the soul rising mountains of the moon at dawn. Obliged by the gods down a song of stars and coniferous splendor greens the calling of reaches higher than our shadows can modernly conceive. Down a song flowing north rises the dawnland of illuminations, welcoming the innermost of elevations to passages of expansions duly received. Behold such noble means of galactic introspection. Behold each peak surrounding each surrounding peak upon peak upon peak. Behold each bewitching reach beyond. Behold this ascension of irrepressible peace. 
Behold your emancipation from all dominions otherwise, for here is where your unconquerable wilderness glistens in the liberty your passion calls home, welcoming all illuminations to the dawnland incandescence of innermost reclamation unshackling the sages from the ages, long now blazing and found. Down this song flowing north amid the boreal chicories, lining the cosmos from the astral floor, appears the realm of the soul rising mountains of the moon at dawn. Obliged by the gods of blossoming cosmographies, behold this land, behold this land, behold this land your passion calls home. short poem here uh, talking about gentrification. I know nobody here knows anything about that. Uh, and it's called Something Ain't Enough for Nothing. Um, uh, occasionally when I write, uh, especially the more I write, the older I get, uh, I start to feel certain voices kind of channel through me with certain witticisms. And this is definitely my grandfather's voice, uh, who always had a really wise kind of parable-like things to say. Uh, something ain't enough for nothing. Back in the day, if you ain't had three-fifths of nothing, you might be able to turn a tea bit of nothing into something. Nowadays, three bits of something ain't enough for nothing. You gotta be Charles Schwab just to even turn the knob. Ain't no room up in this end for me and all my kin. Back in the day, we might find a patch of hate. Nowadays, we out with the trash. Be that. As it may. Mm. All right. mm. yeah. Big is human dignity. Um, so I, I'm an Afrofuturist. Um, so I. Um, live in all tenses, <laughs> past, present, future. And this poem really uh, illustrates it. Once upon a time, there will be this thing called freedom. Oh, if I could only show you the view from there. Liberation for as far as your soul can see. We'll all be loving all the love we please. Once upon a time, there will be this thing called freedom. By this point, folks will have consciously obliterated all forms of bigotry a long time ago. No presumption of supremacy shall ever be allowed there. Once upon a time, there will be this thing called freedom. We will know this to be true because we have always known this to be true. As is the artistry of the horn of the moon, the handiwork of our liberation shall be painted clear across our lives and all the spectral hues of translucent 
transformation, transcendentally raising all ascendant affirmations. Once upon a time, there will be this thing called freedom, liberation, for as far as your soul can see, in pots big as human dignity, folks will be cooking up radicalizations of things that today we couldn't even think to believe. There will be jazz and beats of people dancing in the streets. Folks will be so free. Won't nobody remember any other way to be. Oh, if I could only show you the view from there. Wait till we get there. Yeah. So uh, we, you know, we probably won't see it, but we as humanity, mm -hmm. I can't wait for us to get there. Isn't it sad to say we probably won't see it? But yeah. Well, yep. Yeah, we know. So uh, this next poem, uh, one of the things I love about this book is it, it's just everything, <laughs> and I intentionally. Uh, you know, putting it together, what what should follow what. Um, but, but there's there's a flow, but it's also like an honest flow. Like uh, I might talk about this, or I might talk about that, or I might talk about this. Uh, so this poem is um, a poem I wrote for my mother um, a couple years ago, uh, right at the start of uh, COVID. Uh, for Mother's Day, of course, you know, wasn't able to, uh, to go see her. Uh, but I send this to her now. It's called Just One Bowl, and I, I sent this to her then, <laughs> but I sent it to her now. It's called Just One Bowl of Love. Just One Bowl of Love. My mother, Having raised an entire revolution, my mother makes a whole loaf of freedom from a bowl of access denied. My mother takes a spoonful of sugar and a handful of courage and sees to the horizons of boundless generations. With a taste of sweet potato pie and a generous amount of divine seasoning, my mother has sweetened the courage of every step I take forward. My mother can nourish the consciousness of the entire table from just one bowl of love. My mother makes the whole world so much more livable, knowing full well I love her more than a mere quarantine of miles can ever tell. I love my mother. <laughs> This is one I just wrote the other day. Um, as I was, you know, driving and listening to the news, you know, bad news, bad news, bad news, bad news. And you know, climate change, end of the world. Um, no, no offense to Christians that might be here, but. I miss the days when Revelations was a joke. <laughs> but, um, and I'm listening to the news about, uh, you know, just you know, everything uh, going wrong. And of course, you don't have to listen to the news. You, you could actually just be black in Vermont. 
and, and find out. Um, but I'm listening, and um, and so out came this poem. And I, I, as I was listening to all this, I was just imagining, especially here in Vermont, where we're fortunate enough to still have trees, even if these trees have been cut and regrown, and cut and regrown, at least we still have some trees. And uh, but I was just imagining. Um, what if Columbus didn't come? <laughs> Would we have global warming? Would George Floyd be dead? And you know, the, the list is long. And so this is called, If Columbus Stayed Home. As the world begins to boil, it becomes all the more clear as if it hadn't been abundantly apparent beforehand. What would have happened if Columbus stayed home? If the Mayflower had veered towards the course of the Titanic? If all the arbiters of the alleged new world had stayed home, had stayed in Europe, if all their mechanizations and schemes of prosperity had greedily ruined all of their own lands, had poisoned their own waters, had spawned the diseases and ecological catastrophes and systemic generations of demoralizations that could have better served their own populations. What would have happened here on this land and other lands of the globe if Europe had simply stayed home? What billions of children could have known the arms of their own cultures, their own languages, their own bodies, without the appointed loins? of modern civilization. What would have happened to this planet if Columbus had simply stayed his ass home <laughs> and the redwoods just kept growing? Coincidentally, uh, just before uh, COVID hit and everyone was losing their minds, oh my God, normalcy, why can't we go back to normalcy? Um, just before COVID, I uh, kind of in my own fit of like, um, uh, not being able to stand such normalcy any longer, uh, I made the decision to uh, quit working for the man yeah. Yeah. and to build my own house, a tiny house, with the help of a dear friend. I won't embarrass him by pointing them out here. But with the help of a whole lot of friends, um, and but it was kind of my whole thing of uh, uh, giving myself my own reparations. Uh, I'll accept the further reparations whenever they fully come down the line. But of liberating myself, and uh, it was also around the time I turned sixty. Um, I'm 33 now, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> Afro future. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I decided. You know, I spent my entire life uh, as a poet. You know, uh, you know, and yeah. as was drummed in my head. You know, poets don't make money, and uh, growing up and living most of my life in San Francisco, where rent was always 
right here. Um, and homelessness was always like right there. Um, I, I worked every shit job I could find. And I kept that shit job and I was that good, hopefully not shitty, but I was that good worker that just stayed at his shit job uh, while my creativity was on a back shelf. My creativity was somewhere between getting off work and going to the clubs, house music, Madonna, and back shelf. Uh, but finally, um, uh, it, you know, one of the great things about Vermont uh, particularly uh, as a person of color, is that uh, um, Vermont will definitely make you, uh, you know, push will come to show. Uh, if you've ever uh, been hesitant to, uh, to, to run off the plantation, uh, moving to Vermont will make you get the hell off that <laughs> plantation. And that's not a compliment to Vermont. But, um, so yeah, I, uh, I just kind of, in one crazy moment, said, you know, I'm 60, I've worked my entire life, I'm gonna be a full-time artist from here on out. I'm gonna be a full-time yeah. poet, if I make it. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, thank you, and I have made it, and I'm gonna continue making it, but, this is a poem I wrote, uh, kind of like my resignation letter, uh, resignation letter to society. It's called, Regardless of Whom or Whatsoever. I'm done with the system. I don't want to work for it. I'm done with the system. I'm done. Done. I'm done with the system. I don't want to work for it, nor with it, nor towards its fabled salvage. Oh, if we just work with the system, we just, you know, if we just work with the system, fuck it. I'm done. I'm done. Please note my resignation effective immediately. The system has bound and slowed and measurably penalized every step I've known since birth, as can attest all births prior to my own. All progressions achieved thus far and or forwardly are exclusively the fugitive results of life beyond the grasp of such ill-handed fuckery. I'm done. I'm done with the system. And regardless of whom or whatsoever sanctions otherwise, without need nor want of said regard, I'm done with the system. Please note my resignation effective immediately. I know that that might sound a little comical, but I'm dead serious. Mm -hmm. And I, I really look forward to the day when we all might be just as serious about the system. Uh, when I um, was building my house, uh, intentionally building it to be off-grid, as it is now, uh, I understood off-grid as like off-system. Like, uh, like it, it's more than just electricity or water, but like off-system, off-bigotry, off-racism, off-homophobia, uh, uh, off the whole yeah. damn system. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm just old enough that I can remember being in the back seat of my parents' car going across the Bay Bridge like from Oakland to San Francisco when I was a kid. And the radio was on. My, my father was a, a radio announcer. So the radio was always on. 
And we're going across the bridge, and there's a flash, a news flash. Martin Luther King has just been killed. And that's in my memory bank. And, you know, uh, and then all other assassinations following that. And of course, all the killings prior to King. But, you know, from then throughout my life, um, you know, there's always been someone, whether a politician or a parent or a nice teacher, there's always been someone to preach this story about, well, we just have to work with the system. I know this is fucked up, but we just have to work with it and next time they, they, they won't kill George Floyd. They won't kill Trevor, Tra you know, Trayvon Martin. They won't, you know, the, the list is long. Oh, everything will be fine. We just have to work with the fucking system. Done. Okay. Um, I love preaching to you. Uh, so this next poem is called uh, Small Time Boys. Um, the only thing better than being a young queen is being a, an older queen. <laughs> Not quite ready to be an old queen, but an older queen. <laughs> but, uh, uh, because when you're an older queen or an older black person, or I think just an older person in general, uh, there's a lot of shit you just won't take uh, at all. Uh -huh. And you're, you're a lot quicker to tell it like it is, and uh, I, I got in trouble with that when I first moved to Vermont, <laughs> tell it like it is. Uh, I thought everyone got that money. Got that. People have been saying that since the 70s. But, um, uh, so this poem is called Small Time Boys, and it's kind of talking about, uh, um, you know, the, the persistence of certain meddling straight boys, certain meddling <laughs> other folk. Um, uh, I don't mean to be heterosexist. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just joking. But so it's called Small Time Boys. Small Time Boys, always sniffing at my joys, looking at my voice. Licking at my toys, small time boys, dancing tantrums in my foils, pitching ransoms full of noise, thinking they can ride my passions with such teeny little egos, full of such itty bitty swords, small time boys, falling fast around my porch, thinking. God's hand almighty somehow graces them to storm my shores. Small time boys, always sniffing at my joys, flipping colonies in the guise of snakeskin lures. Small time boys, better get from around my floors. I'm a whole lot of reason. Liberation gets to stomp the shit out of all them small time boys. <laughs> dedicated to all the homophobes of the world. <laughs> you know, uh, in San Francisco in the 80s, or my 20s, in the 90s, you know, it was backed up, uh, but there was also a group called Queer Nation, uh, which uh, I definitely associate myself with. And Queer Nation, uh, especially thinking, you know, 80s, 70s, 60s, uh, as a reaction to homophobia and uh, communal desires for us to assimilate, and Queer Nation was like, fuck that. Like, 
fuck that. It was entirely uh, unapologetic. Um, This is a short poem here called Peekaboo. Uh, uh, just a little backstory. You know, when, when you're living here in Vermont, uh, that's a person of color. Um, you're constantly, and of course, this is true for the whole country, but there's something about the microscopic, intense lens of Vermont. It's like, Sort of lens that would like set a blade of grass on fire. Um, you, uh, uh, I think W.B. Du Bois talked about as African Americans, we have the like, double consciousness where uh, we have to live in a world of hyper visibility. Oh my God, it's a black guy. Uh, and hyper invisibility all in the same schizophrenic space, mm -hmm. making no sense. Uh, but, so this is called peekaboo. Just because you close your eyes doesn't mean I'm not here. Isn't that amazing? It's remarkable how Profoundly, I do exist with or without your eyes. Um, one thing, so I, I live here in the kingdom, I'm, I'm in Newark. Um, well, woods. It's funny when I uh, meet people in Montpelier or the, anywhere else on that side of the state and tell them I'm in Newark, they'll say, oh, you must be right at the border. No, <laughs> no there's, there's still more roads to go before you get to the border. But, um, but one thing I've, I've really enjoyed this summer, and it's such a great, it still is such a great summer. But on the occasional cool night, because you know, being the queen I am, you know, just you know, like Josh the Boar, just because I moved to the woods, I still have my furs, <laughs> you know, and all my nice clothes. And uh, and so, one of the pleasures <laughs> I've kind of had this summer, and definitely during the winter, walking my dog down the country street is a uh, country road <laughs> is uh, you know I, I'll get dressed to walk my dog <laughs> it's just kind of funny and uh, but uh, a few weeks ago when the, there was some, some cool night got down to like the 40s uh, which was just wonderful and uh, early in the summer a friend uh, who, who knew me well enough how to really like know, what sort of gift to give me. He gave me this beautiful full length fur coat. <laughs> and, uh, and it had been warm that day. I had been in Lake Willoughby and I had these really <laughs> super short shorts, cut off shorts, and I sewed red buttons all around the <laughs> leg. And so I walked, my, my dog is named Willoughby, and I walked Willoughby in my full length fur coat <laughs> and my hot shorts. Yeah. And, but these are the ways, you know, uh, talking back to Queer Nation, you know, the, the only way we can get out of closets or get out of, uh, Slavery is to get out, to come out, yeah. and, uh, and and be our authentic selves. All of us, uh, sexually, racially, culturally, socially, uh, fully be yourself all the time, uh, all the time. 
I, I only have um, I only have myself, and I'm myself uh, wherever I am. Sorry. Yeah, I'm gonna come up preach. So that this uh, next poem I'm gonna do is called "Why Hate Love." And um, again, you know, dealing with some of the hate in this state um, gives you, uh, it, it sharpens your defensive skills. Uh, and so this is my response to some of the homophobic hate that I've received. It's called, Why Hate Love? Look. Fuck all you idiots. <laughs> all of them. <laughs> who just can't grasp the fact that who I love, how I love, and how good that love is, ain't got shit to do with you. Yeah. The world spins forward whether you dig it or not. A globe set in motion is not for backward glances. I am and will be loved irrepressibly. And in conjunction and in return, I shall love most naturally, fantastically, in the light and in the streets. My love is a declaration nothing can defeat. This is a love like all good love. Dig love, and love shall dig you free. No need to hate the music. Just go on and love your own sweetness. While I go on and sweetly love the love I love, liberally, constitutionally, eyes, ears, lips, body, mind, and soul. Besides, regardless of the fools who beg to differ, this love doesn't give a shit who dares to quit. This love will kick the ass of denial every which way the heart flows. This love is beautiful. This love makes the Louvre lose its speech. This love walks on water and keeps the beat. This love can shine through walls 50 states thick. <laughs> you can't fuck with this. So why hate love? You better recognize this sweetness. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When, um, when Trump was in office, I, I just kept wishing some queen would just his ass out. I don't, I don't know why it's an ultra. Like we, uh, we can be so protective of the devil. Uh, we can fight all day long about who is not the devil. Or we can definitely protect him. Um, this poem uh, is dedicated to um, dear friend Fern Feather. Yeah. Um, yeah. And just honoring, honoring them. Uh, Fern was a good friend of mine. Uh, I was always glad to see Fern. Uh, and we would, when I lived in Montpelier, we would often run into each other on the street, Charles and uh, we would often comment about, oh, thank God. Another, another queer person. Um, but, uh, so this is called Feeling Fern. In honor of my dear friend, Fern Feather, 1992, 2022, and all who are assailed by hate. I love his light and his walking truth. 
I love the feel of her gleaming sorority. I love their feeling the courage to simply be and to bloom. And for however many times Fern was stabbed, I ache and bleed from every wound so many of us do. Only Fern's smile blooms me through and through. Mm. One of the things that Fern and I had in common, appreciate is that um, we, would, we would use all pronouns, like all 53 pronouns, <laughs> in the yeah. course of a conversation. And uh, uh, and I, it's definitely one of the things I miss about San Francisco or being in like huge queer spaces is the um, there's such a multiplicity of pronouns. It's like, uh, you know, if you're referring to Trump, you might say, you know, she needs to get the hell out of that office. <laughs> but, yeah. Anyway, that's a whole other story. Okay. He does. <laughs> um, okay. This is called All This Grace. Uh, and I hope that uh, uh, I would love for this poem to be read by uh, anyone struggling with um, um, respect, dignity, or recognition in this society. All this grace. I'm so sorry. I know, I know you'd love to hate me, but much to your chagrin, my humanity is just much too much for even you to withstand. I know you'd love to detest my face but much to your own wretchedly vile disgrace. My badass beauty just keeps shining with every last look you take. I know, I know. How could God create all this grace? <laughs> Step aside, world. I'm about to light this goodness from here to outer space. God don't spoil gold, not God. Gold don't spoil for nobody, no matter what they say. Um, you know, one of the things I've noticed uh, uh, during the, well, this summer, uh, with tourism this summer, is, uh, uh, you know, just kind of further extensions of uh, privilege. Uh, I'm a tourist from who knows where. I'm in this new place called Vermont, so I'm going to walk in the middle of the road. I'm going to just walk in the middle of the road, because I, I got that privilege. Um, I thought maybe you'd laugh. <laughs> so, uh, it's okay, we, we can talk about that. Why did it stop in the middle of the road? <laughs> I, I, uh, I often take Darling to the road to go into Lindenville. And, uh, you know, there are all the people on the bikes grandma, grandpa, the grandkids, the nephews, the cousins. And they're like spread across the road. <laughs> and uh, uh, of all the cars I've owned, I don't think I've ever used my horn. Uh, not because I was afraid of being an asshole, 
But I have a fear that, that my horn will get stuck. <laughs> so I, I've just never used it. But I almost used it several times this summer. And this is called Quit Taking Up the Road. <laughs> I feel like I'm becoming a real Vermont. Yeah. Quit Taking Up the Road. Okay. White privilege straddles down the road. <laughs> Not along the shoulder, but straddles all across the street, all across the middle of what should be decency. Just so, just in case the world didn't fully understand, just so all the world could plainly see just for whom all roads do supremely neat. Um, has, is there anyone here who has uh, uh, been invited to your friend's, your, your white friend's house, and then you have to meet their parents? Anyone had that experience? Um, this is called, I love speaking to uh, This is called This Silent Scramble. Meeting your white friend's parents is always a cultural endeavor. Especially when your white friends insist on being even more clueless than their parents. It becomes such a silent scramble to then pirouette between flying daggers and trenching rounds of automatic denials, while I, blackening for my life, am guessing who's not coming for dinner, never to be seen again. <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. 